Uh, we, uh, we value discipleship deeply at Red Point. And not just at Red Point, I think it's in the scriptures. As, as believers, we, we love to see people taking steps forward in what God's calling them to. And part of that is from our young, part of it's to the old, I think of Caleb at 85, reaching for his hill country. It's all of us pursuing God with all of our hearts. And part of that this morning is that we have three people, new voices, who will be um, sharing for 10 minutes each this morning and uh, really wanting to encourage you to open up your hearts and for you to be stirred to step into. I love when I asked all three of them, not one of them hesitated. What a gift. Not one of them hesitated. There, there was yes before they thought about it in a sense. I was like, praise God for that. And, and would we, when we receive an invitation, a sense of a call, would you, yes, before you think about it in a sense, to walk into the things of God. So we've got three guys who are going to be sharing with us. Would you open up your hearts on our biblical character series, and we want to hear what they have to, to, to say. So Sarah's going to start us off, then we've got Nathan Way, and then we've got Lysias coming after that. Amen. Let's welcome them up. Come on, give them a move. Good morning, everybody. Today, I am going to be looking at three different characters whose stories are interwoven in Mark chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles here, please will you open them up to Mark chapter 5. Um, we're going to be starting at verse 21, and I'll read a little portion, and then we'll put ourselves into the stories. Okay. Okay, so Mark chapter 5, verse 21. I am reading from the NKJV version, so it is slightly different. Um, <laughs> so it starts off verse 21. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, came Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live so Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. And so I'd really love us to put ourselves into the story, to place ourselves into the shoes of this character. So the beginning of this passage, it obviously starts off by a huge group of crowd who are waiting at the seashore, waiting for Jesus to arrive. And one of the people who are there, his name is Jairus, and he was a synagogue leader, which meant that he was a man of stature, and he had power in his um, influence, the circle of influence. And he had a daughter who was very sick. There are some translations that speak about how the daughter who was already lying at the point of death. And so we can see that he had full faith that Jesus was the one who was able to heal her. But at the same time, we can feel the sense of urgency that he had as he wanted Jesus to quickly come with him to get to his daughter um, to heal her. And so it carries on in verse 25. And it says, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if only I may, I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And we need to read this portion of scripture with the 12 years of suffering that this woman had had behind it. And so if we just use a bit of our imagination and we place ourselves in her shoes, we can think back to the first time when she started bleeding. And at first, she probably just thought that it was nothing different. It was maybe just another menstrual cycle. Um, the scriptures kind of mentioned that she was an adult, so maybe she was married, and maybe it was another month where she wasn't given the blessing of a child. And days would have turned into weeks, and she maybe started to notice that this cycle was longer than normal, and so she got concerned and started to ask the ladies around her, maybe her mom or a sister or a friend, if this was normal, and maybe she was met with some concern, and so she started to go and seek medical advice. And these days turned into weeks, and these weeks turned into months, and these months turned into years, and these years turned into more than a decade, and the bleeding did not stop. Um, it speaks about how she spent all that she had seeking medical advice. She would have tried countless different medications. She would have undergone countless different treatments only for her condition to grow worse. Not only was there physical pain, but there was emotional and there was social pain too. At the time, the law of Moses was being followed, which you can read about in Leviticus. Um, but one of the laws 
speaks about how if a person was bleeding, they were declared as ceremonially unclean. And so there were a whole lot of different things that they needed to complete until they became clean again. And one of the things that happened was that they would have to wash themselves until the bleeding stopped and they had to be put into isolation. Nobody was allowed to touch them because if somebody touched them, then they would also be declared ceremonially unclean. So this woman was in isolation essentially for 12 years. Um, so what happened if the wound didn't heal? What happened to this woman who couldn't stop bleeding? Her contamination didn't become clean. Her time in isolation didn't end. In verse 27, it speaks about how she came behind Jesus. And of course, she didn't brazenly want to go up to Jesus and ask him for a touch of healing because then he would have been made unclean. And in fact, this woman shouldn't have been caught up in this crowd at all. Um, in verse 25, it doesn't reveal the name of the woman. It refers to her as a certain woman. And this could mean that the author is just speaking about a specific woman, but I think that there could be slightly more to it in this word choice. She was a certain woman. She was certain of her pain. She was certain of her suffering. She was certain she tried everything she could to find healing. She was certain that nothing was helping. But then she heard about Jesus. She heard about the things that he had done. She heard about the miracles that he had performed. She heard that he was the son of God, and she became certain that he held the power to heal her, even from just one little touch of his garment. Other translations say that she touched the tassel of his prayer shawl. The tassels on the prayer shawls were a symbol for the Jews to remember that they were praying to a covenant-keeping God who took them out of slavery. And so this woman reached out her faith and she became one with this covenant keeping God. In verse 29, it says, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Other translations say that her faith had made her whole, and there's a very big difference between being made healed and being made whole. Jesus didn't call her out of this crowd to shun her or to put further shame upon her. He singled her out to make her whole. He could have just physically healed her and gone about his way, but instead he reaffirmed her in front of a multitude of people where she would, she would previously have been given looks of concern or disgust or where people would have just avoided her, she now would have been looked at in admiration of her faith. Jesus healed her body, but in this moment, he healed her soul. He told her that her faith in him had healed her. He affirmed her position in society. He showed the people around her that she was a woman who was worthy of dignity and of honor. Um, she remains unnamed. We don't really know what the rest of her story is, but we know that she heard the words of Jesus and she believed them with all of her heart. And so she is a woman who we should all aspire to be like. And the chapter carries on. Let's not forget about old Jairus. <laughs> so although a miracle had just taken place and a woman had been made whole and she had been reinstated into society, for Jairus, the journey to go and heal his daughter had been interrupted and had been delayed. So in verse 35, it says, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. 
Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly not to tell anybody, and that something should be given to her to eat. So what does the story teach us? Firstly, we may be like Jairus. Maybe there is something that we are desperately needing Jesus' help with, and we might feel frustrated or disheartened because it feels like Jesus isn't moving fast enough, or he's too busy answering everybody else's prayers that he's not going to answer our own. But from Jairus, we can learn that Jesus isn't in a rush, and there isn't a timeline that he has to stick to in order to answer our prayers. Jesus is good, he is sovereign, and his timing is perfect. We need to take Jesus at his word that he spoke to Jairus, that we don't need to be afraid, we just need to believe. Secondly, from the woman, we learn that we need to hear his stories and believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is who he says he is. We don't need to hide and sneak around to touch the hem of his garment. We can come before him with boldness and with faith, and he is the only one who can fully heal and make us whole. And lastly, we may be like Jairus' daughter. We need to believe that his intentions for our lives are good, even if it doesn't look like it. We need to know that he calls us and views us affectionately as his little son or his little daughter, no matter what our age is. We need to know that we are precious to him. And if there is something in our lives that maybe feels like it is already dead, we know that Jesus is the one who gently touches us, speaks it back to life, and calls us to arise. So sometimes, I know we can rush on, but sometimes there's, there's a moment, and I just feel like, just, I, wanna, I want Sarah to pray for us, just that we would bank this. Because there's truths here. This isn't just a discipleship morning. There's truths that have just been spoken that I think can deeply move our hearts. Some of us are waiting for things. Some of us are trusting God for things. I just want to say to pray for us so that we can just bank this moment, if you don't mind. So Jesus, we just thank you that you are good and that you are kind. We thank you, Jesus, that from you flows abundant life. We thank you, Jesus, that you were there in the story, God, and you are here with us now and that you are the same God. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the one who gives gifts abundantly, Lord God, and we just want to lift up anybody who feels like their prayers are being left unheard, who feels like you are distant, and who feels like maybe you're busy doing other things, Jesus. And we just pray, Lord God, that your presence would be so close to them and that they would know that you are near and that they would believe the words that you say, that we do not need to be afraid because you are here. We do not need to be afraid because you are listening to us, Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that we would believe the words that you say. And we just think of the woman, Lord God, who knew with all of her heart that you were the one who could heal her. She didn't need to keep going to all these different doctors to find healing. She just needed to come to you. And so, Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning in whatever aspect is necessary, and we pray, Lord God, that you would bring healing, that you would heal our souls, that you would heal our hearts, and that you would make us whole in your sight, Jesus. And we thank you for the little girl, Jesus. We thank you that you are our Father. And we thank you, Jesus, that you look down at us with love and with tenderness, and that you call us your little girl or your little boy. And we pray, Jesus, that our um, identity would be secure in the fact that you are our Father. And we just pray, Lord God, for parts of us that might feel like they are dead or decaying, Jesus, and we pray that you would speak them back to life. And we pray, Lord God, just through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that you would call us to arise into everything that you have called us to, and that we would all take a step further into your kingdom and a step closer to you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well done, sir. Thank you. Nathan, I don't know where you are. Oh, there you are. Morning, Red Point Church. It is such a joy and a privilege to be here with you this morning. For those of you who don't, me, who don't know me, my name is Nate. Uh, thank you to the elders for this opportunity to share. So before I begin, allow me to paint a picture in your minds. 
I love a trip down to Cape Town, and one of the many reasons why is for Table Mountain. But often you get there, it's a long drive or a long flight, and you get to this mountain and it's just covered in clouds. And you don't get to see it, and you don't get to enjoy it or take in the views. But then you wait a little while, and as soon as that cloud cover is lifted, you, the mountain finally appears, and you can finally enjoy the fullness of what's on offer. So with that, with that in mind, I'd like to speak on the story of Peter this morning. And the reason why I've chosen part of his story is because there's something in his life and in his story that we can all relate to. And I'm hoping to dive into that in these next 10 minutes. So a brief background to who Peter was. He was one of the first disciples called by Jesus. He walked very closely with Jesus during his ministry, during his time on earth. And he eventually goes on to become one of the most prominent figures in the history of the early church. But Peter wasn't perfect. He was human just like you and I. He made several mistakes. And he experiences this real sense of failure and disappointment over his life. Like, almost like he let himself down, like he let his Lord down. But then something beautiful happens to him. So let's pick up the story in John chapter 13, verse 36 to 38. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples about his, before his death, speaking to his disciples about his upcoming resurrection and ascent into heaven. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So skipping ahead to John chapter 18, verse 15 to 17, and then 25 to 27. Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. So this is around. The other disciple came back, spoke to the servant outside, and brought Peter in. Then the servant asked him, I'm one of this man's disciples too, are you? To which Peter replies, I am not. Verse 25. Uh, meanwhile, Peter was still standing there warming himself, so they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? Again, he denied it, saying, no, I am not. One of the high priest servants challenged him, but didn't I see you in the garden with him earlier? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. In another account of the story in Matthew 26, verse 75, it says, Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And then Peter went outside and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Peter's sense of, of failure and disappointment was deep, and this moment no doubt would have hurt Peter. And it must have felt like such a big stain on his life, and no doubt would have weighed heavily on his heart and mind. Think of the kind of negative impact this burden of failure and disappointment can have on not only Peter's life, but on your life, both in the short term and also in the long term. So shortly after this, Jesus is led to his death on the cross. Um, he's raised to life, and then he appears again to Peter and the disciples. And, and Peter's failures would have felt like this dark cloud hanging over him, and this cloud needed to be lifted. And this moment comes in John chapter 21, verse 15 to 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times Peter denied or disowned Jesus. And three times Jesus reaffirms his, Peter's love for him. But by asking him this and by doing this, Three times, I believe that Jesus completely removes the stain of Peter's failure and of Peter's disappointment, and that cloud is lifted. Peter now has the chance to leave his mistakes behind him and to get up and go again. He can walk freely into what God has in store for him and can now enjoy the fullness of the resurrection of Jesus. Two years ago, I had the privilege of joining Tula and a small team from Redpoint and Highway on a trip to Portugal where we attended a leadership training time. And one of the group discussions that we had there was around Peter and his life. And we were posed with the question, 
how would you define Peter? Or what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Peter? And the majority of the answers, myself included, were around the Peter's denial of Jesus. Oh, Peter was the one who denied Jesus. And, but then we were asked, what if instead of defining Peter as the one who denied Jesus, we define Peter as the one who was restored by Jesus? Our mistakes and our failures do not have the final say in our lives. It is the gospel that does. And I wonder how many times during his life, Peter would have had to remind himself of how Jesus restored him. How many times the enemy would have whispered in his ear, remember that time you denied Jesus. Remember all of your other mistakes and failures. How often does the enemy want to remind us of our mistakes or shortfalls? When we aren't centered on the freedom that Christ has won for us, our failures can become a burden and they can hinder us. Peter was hurt by his denial of Jesus, and he would have carried that hurt with him up until Jesus restored him. But in order to truly overcome that hurt, he needed to anchor himself in what Christ did for him and use that as his launching pad into becoming one of the most prominent figures in church history. But then after Peter was restored by Jesus, Jesus puts a call on his life. Feed my sheep. Jesus reaffirms Peter's love for him and calls Peter to demonstrate that love by serving the church. Peter then goes on to do some incredible things and you can continue reading his story through the book of Acts. But alongside the other apostles, he continues to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and perform many signs and wonders that sees thousands get saved. Acts 2 verse 41 says that um, Peter preached a message, they accepted his message, were baptized, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. And Acts 2 verse 47, it says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Acts 4 verse 4 then says that this number grew to about 5,000. And Acts 5 verse 14 continues to say, more and more women, men and women believed and were added to their number. And then in Acts verse 6, it says, the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. There were many more signs and wonders that Peter would have performed in his life, but I believe the catalytic moment in his life and his ministry was his restoration by Jesus. The blood of Jesus restores us. And just like Peter, we each have a call on, our, call on our life and an invitation to get stuck into what God is doing through his church. Can I encourage you to accept that invitation? For a while, I was content to just attend church on a Sunday and leave it at that, thinking, you know what, I've given my life to Jesus, I've been saved, I'm going to heaven, that's enough for me. But there came a time where that complacency led to me losing my passion and then even just attending church on a Sunday became a chore. And it wasn't until I got stuck into serving and going on mission that that complacency started, I started to lose that complacency and I started to get my passion and purpose back. Sometimes we can often look at a man like Peter and think to ourselves, geez, I could never have the impact that Peter had on the church or I could never do the things that Peter did. But thinking like that leads to insecurity and doubts, which will also hinder you. God called Peter to his own story and he calls you and I each to our own story within his bigger story. We each have our own giftings, our own calling, and our own role to play in the body of Christ. Don't just sit back. There's a much bigger story that God is calling us into. So what can we learn from Peter's story? We all carry some type of failure, some kind of disappointment, but Jesus is never done with you. No mess up is too big. His love and his grace run deep and wide. We all fall short in some way, but he lovingly restores us and brings us back to him. His death and resurrection allows us to throw our failures and disappointments at the foot of the cross and at the empty grave and walk freely into his plans and purposes for our lives. When you do mess up, pursue him wholeheartedly just as he pursue, pursues you. Get up and go again because there's so much more waiting for us. Thank you. So Lord, we... We just thank you for your love and your grace over us, God. And we think of the many different people here today, the many different situations here today, God. We thank you that you know them all. We thank you that you know the need of each and every single one of us here today, Lord God. And we pray for, for hearts that are broken, for, for situations that seem too difficult to overcome, Lord God. We, we thank you for what you did in Peter's life, for how despite his various failures and shortfalls, you restored him and he was able to do so many powerful and incredible things by the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. And we just pray that 
where there is failure and shortfall and disappointment here this morning, God, would, would you restore us there, God? Would you remind us of your love? Would you remind us of your grace, God? Would you remind us of our purposes, Jesus? For those here this morning who are unsure of their call or where they fit into the body of Christ, God, we pray that you would give gifts this morning, that you would speak a word over people's life this morning, Lord God. So thank you for what you're doing through us and through your church. Thank you for your love, Jesus. And we just pray that your spirit would empower us going forward, Lord God. Amen. Uh, good morning, Red Point. I'm just having some butterflies, but uh, I will be okay. <laughs> I would like to, <laughs> I would like to thank the the leadership of this church for giving me an opportunity, just to uh, to share a stage with young people that are passionate for Jesus. And uh, for some of you who do not know uh, me, I work with the, uh, Youth of the Mission. And um, it's always a, a great privilege to see young people rising up and taking their position in Christ. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Nate. And um, what is amazing is that I'm going to be sharing about um, Nehemiah and how God used him. But what I'm seeing here with what Sarah shared and what Nate has shared, I can see a redemptive story. I can see God's grace in the restoration of individuals. The women with an issue of blood, God restored her. And Jesus' purpose is to restore people so that they can function well. That they can move in the purposes that he designed them for. And we see him restoring uh, Jairus' daughter. And we don't know, it's not written what she did after Jesus raised her from the dead. But I'm sure she woke up from the dead and served the Lord. We don't know how. But one day in eternity, we will get to see it. And we see Peter being restored by Jesus. He made mistakes. But God is not, does not concentrate on the mistakes that we do. Otherwise, I won't be here. But he's a God of love. He restores Peter and he uses him to build his church. So there's a redemptive story here. God redeems individuals. And as we look at the story of Nehemiah, we see God's heart for redeeming nations and restoring nations. So let us read. I want to read from Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. Verse 17 to 18. And then I would read again from Nehemiah chapter 6, verse um, 15 to 16. So let us read. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates bent Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Chapter 6, verse 15 uh, to 16. So the war was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in, the, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and, and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The reason why I chose Nehemiah is because he's a practical guy. Christianity is not about just speaking in tongues and feeling good. 
It's a practical movement. God is in the business of restoring his people and building his kingdom. So just to give a historical background of Nehemiah, who is Nehemiah? So Nehemiah was one of the generation that was born in captivity. We know Israel had sinned because of idolatry, and God has sent them to Babylon. And one thing that Jeremiah said when they were being deported to, to Babylon, this is what he says. When you are in Babylon, do not be idle. I'm just paraphrasing. But I would want you to multiply. I would want you to, to plant gardens. I would want you to build houses. In other words, be involved in the affairs of that nation. Why? Because through the covenant he had with Abraham, he said, I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. What we learn from there, as Nick was saying, we're going to take over the next responsibility for the church. In the case of Israel, though they were going into captivity, it looks like this was the end. But in his ultimate plan, he said, you do not dare diminish because the next generation is going to fulfill my plans for the nations. And we see him raising Nehemiah, who was uh, a Jewish leader and who served under the king at Azixis and as a cupbearer. And one day his brother came back from those who had gone back and told him about Jerusalem. The walls are broken. People are in trouble. And it moved him. He identified with God's heart that was broken for Israel. So what we learn from Nehemiah here, that when we see the brokenness around us, God wants to restore that brokenness. The brokenness of families, the brokenness of societies, the brokenness of individuals, like in the case of the women with the issue of blood. Jesus' desire is to restore them. But Jesus is not here, like in the day of that woman. You and I are here. And because Christianity is about blessing others, he's calling us like Nehemiah. So when he had that, he took time to pray. And I'm going to share three keys that made Nehemiah, why was Nehemiah successful? As we, as we know, with the kings of the past, you would not just say, I'm going to take leave. That could have costed his life because being a cup bearer, you were actually the one who was responsible for taking, as we can say in these days, the bullet for the king. Because they would taste the wine of the king. And they didn't have hitmen as they have today, who would shoot with bullets. The hitman was in the cup. <laughs> That's how they would assassinate kings, by poisoning them. So a cup bearer was a highly ranked official who was very trusted by the king. So there's no way other Zixis will just say, go. But what... What we can learn from Nehemiah is that he took time to pray. Prayer is very important. We cannot overemphasize the importance of prayer. Why? Because in prayer, we get to possess what we call God-inspired vision. God inspired the vision of the restoration of, Jer of, of Jerusalem to Nehemiah in the place of seeking him. So we see that when God's heart is broken towards nations, he breaks our hearts. And we are motivated to do what God would do if he... If and we also see that when we spend time the Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding, but in everything acknowledge the Lord. God is in the 
this principle. Also says, seek me and you will live. When you seek me, you will live. How nations live is not by our gifts, it's not by what we do, but by seeking the face of God. And that is key to success. God has got a vision for each and every one of us as individuals. But for you to know the ultimate vision of God for you, you need to seek him. You need to seek him. So persistence in prayer, seeking God's face, do not lean on your own understanding. So the third, second thing I want us to see in Jeremiah, uh, in Nehemiah, it says, he embraced a God-led plan. Do things right. He did the right thing, but doing things right depends on what God gives you in terms of his blueprint for that thing. Nehemiah requested letters for the governors for protection and for provision. When the king says, for how long are you going to go? He prayed and God gave him a plan for provision, for protection. And if you'd, I would encourage you to read the whole book. There's a lot we can glean from there. But I don't want to, uh, to keep the dead salivating for the brownies. I'm going to finish now. But if you go back to that book and begin, you can glean a lot of principles and values that we can use in today in building nations. Let me say that Jesus is just not interested in, in building religious groups. Jesus' interest and desire is connected to the creation mandate. When you say you take dominion over everything God has created, and that includes building the wall, building broken nations, God wants to send us into the world when we take time to seek him. I can think of uh, King Asa. He says, as long as King Asa sought the Lord, he prospered. So when the elders invite us to come and pray, we better pay attention because that's God's plan for the building of nations for building and restoring individuals. When he restores individuals, his ultimate goal is to restore South Africa. If he has touched you, his ultimate goal is not just you, it's nations. Because we are Abraham's children, and the top blessing of Abraham is that I will bless you, but the bottom line is that you will be a blessing to the nations. When you go back to your vocation, let me just say, God will use the vocation you have as a platform to advance his kingdom. He used the position of Nehemiah as a cup bearer to send him because he had gained experience in the civil government and he became the governor of Jerusalem. So your vocation can prepare you for the ultimate call and plan of God. But sometimes we think that my vocation is just to build my tummy. God thinks beyond your tummy. God thinks nations, thinks restoration. This is the challenge that God is giving us. My last point, he relied on a, what we call a God-motivated action. That's why he mobilized families to build where they were staying. In 52 days, they completed the wall. And in my research, I found out that during the, the Ottoman Empire, they, they asked to rebuild the wall and it took them four years. But Nehemiah, so this is the miracle. God can fast track the things that might take years for you to do. And when we think South Africa is broken, when we think Africa is broken, there's poverty everywhere. If we connect with the heart of God, 
we will be amazed by what God can do. The reason God is not moving in the degree that he wants to is because we are complacent. Or, you know, sometimes I just think, no, I just want to, to play in the shallows. Because if I go deeper, I don't know where God can take me. You might just make me like Daniel. We want to play safe. We want to have some control. But if we will determine in our hearts to go deeper, it is to the degree that we see God, it is to the same degree God that will move in a nation or in an individual's life. Like Nehemiah sought the face of God. He wept day and night. If you read uh, the, the, the first chapter, day and night. Now in closing, I'd like just to ask you, what is it that God has put in your heart? Or what brokenness has God shown you? What challenges, what needs in the community that God has shown you? And what are you doing about it? Nehemiah rose to the challenge and God did a miracle that in 52 days, that's a record time, they built the wall. God can restore our nations, our continent in a record time. Even we can give our hearts fully to seeking him. So this is the challenge that I have for us. And if the elders don't mind, I would like to pray. In closing, and if you, we can please just stand with me. And I was, as I was think, uh, thinking about just what to pray for, I felt to challenge myself and to challenge us to take hold of the vision, the dreams, the aspiration that you have, hold it in your hand. And like Nehemiah could have been sitting pretty in Susa, enjoying the delicacies of the king, but he relinquished that right. And I felt that as you hold on to the vision, to your vocation, to what you are doing, just give it to the Lord. And the Lord will multiply it back more than you can even think. So if we can just stretch your hand to the Lord and hold the vision, the dream that we have as we pray. Father, we thank you this morning we hold our dreams, our vision, everything we have belongs to you. And God, we want to relinquish the callings. We relinquish the vocations. We relinquish the careers, our jobs to you. That God, you may multiply them back to us. That the nations may be blessed. That God, our nation may be redeemed that Africa will never be the same again. That God, you raise men and women of courage in this congregation. We will not just sit, but we will rise up and be as industrious as Nehemiah. We'll be courageous, even though they were enemies, but he stood his ground. And you gave him, Father Lord God, even strategy to defend himself and to defend the Jews. When we seek you, God, you have got a plan for our lives. We bless you. We exalt your name. We give glory and honor to you. We thank you in advance for what you are doing. We thank you in advance, Lord God, for leading us and to guiding us. In Jesus' name, amen. Is that not compelling? Yuff. So there's been a lot said this morning, and uh, I'm sure we could close this in a number of different ways, but probably the thing that I've been carrying through is that, is that and we've been speaking about it in the office, is that people get stuck. You can get stuck. And I think of Jarius and um, from where Sarah spoke, like you can get stuck in your circumstance. Actually, circumstance might be around you, and it's holding you from moving forward because you, you feel like you need to, something needs to happen. 
Think of um, Nate speaking about Peter and how our sin or our brokenness or something that we've done stops us from moving forward because we live with this cloud over us. And I think of, of Alicia just speaking about even comfort. Sometimes your own comfort, the, 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 the lifestyle that you have holds you from really living radically. What a compelling, compelling message. And uh, I feel there's a response from us this morning. And I know we've responded, but I think actually we need to, we need to move forward, often to get out of our, our place. And we actually need a, a moment where God ministers to us and meets with us so that we can begin to move forward into what God has for us. So if, if you have one of those three things, if you feel circumstances stopped you from moving forward in God's call on your life, I'd love for you to come forward. If you feel like it's sin that's held you and that you can't move forward, I'd love for you to come forward. And if you feel like circumstance, I love that call to prayer, but like that, uh, that sense of comfort where I'm just, I'm comfortable, I'm lazy, I'm whatever, I'm apathetic. I feel like I've lost the passion of God for the kingdom of God advancing. I want to invite you to come forward. Maybe just come forward. There's, I'm sure the messages are spoken to all of us.